Hello, how are you doing? Uh, it's another great day, actually. Uh, it's a big pleasure today. I want to speak about the law versus grace. You see, there are so many times people don't really understand the difference between living under the law and living under the grace. Many people still think uh, we are under the law. Like there are so many churches, like there's a huge church called the SDA, which believes 100% that you have to keep the law. They, they even believe actually we have to keep the day of Sabbath. And uh, others, of course, which... Um, Almost many, many, many religions, they, 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 they tend to want to keep the law. And I want to ask you today, do you think we're supposed to keep the law today? And uh, are, we, are we even permitted to keep the law if we wanted? Because if we understand this, then we'll be able to understand what's grace and what's law. So um, to begin with, I'm going to start from the book of uh, John 1.17. John 1.17, the Bible says, for the law came by Moses, but grace and truth came by Jesus Christ. So we are told here that the law, law came by Moses, uh, law came by Moses, but uh, grace, grace and truth by Jesus. So there is a big difference here. Law came by Moses, and grace and truth came by Jesus. So that's the first detail that we have concerning the, the two. So now, if you want to keep the law, there are a couple of things that you have to do. If you say, now, I want to keep the law, these are a couple of things that you need to do. Number one, let me just write here. If you have to keep the law, uh, you have to keep these things. Number one, you have to get circumcised. Uh, let's see. This is an order from God, yeah, for those people who want to keep the law. In Galatians 5.3, the Bible says, For I testify again to every man that is circumcised that he is, he is a debtor to do the whole law. So if you're circumcised, first of all, this means already being circumcised was a law which was given to the children of Israel, that every Jew has to be circumcised, all right? And that's, that was the first thing that they have to do. And once you're circumcised, then you have also to keep the whole law. In Galatians 6, 13 says, For neither they themselves who are circumcised keep the law, but desire to have you circumcised that they may glory in your flesh. So here Paul is saying, even these guys who are already circumcised, who are keeping, who are trying to say that we are keeping the law, they themselves cannot even keep the same law, all right? But they want you also to be circumcised or in short to keep the law so that they may glory in your flesh, in your failures. Verse 14 says, but God forbid that I should glory, save in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ by whom the world is crucified unto me, and I unto the world. All right? For in Christ Jesus, neither circumcision availeth anything, nor uncircumcision, but a new creature. We are told in Christ Jesus, uh, in Christ Jesus, all which applies is a new creature. We are told the moment we believe, we become a new creature. This is what applies in grace. But here, circumcision or anything, all those things don't really apply and don't even make any sense according to what the Bible says. When you're in the, under grace, you're a new creature. But here, circumcision, no matter how much you, you do circumcision and all those kind of things which have been said by the law, it will avail nothing under grace. So the second thing that you have to do is you have to become a Jew. All right, become a Jew. You have to become a Jew or uh, we can call it a Jewish proselyte. A Jewish proselyte. Proselyte uh, literally means uh, someone who, who has uh, been converted. A Jewish convert, all right? That's a Jewish proselyte. Now, for you to follow the law, like I've told you, you have to become a Jew. Let's see some verses supporting this. In Hebrews 7, 11, the Bible says, If therefore perfection were by the Levitical priesthood, for under it the people received the law, what further need was there that another priest should rise at, after the order of Melchizedek and not be called after the order of Aaron? So there's something that you need to understand. 
Jesus is a priest, but he's not a priest under the, the order of uh, the, the Levites, That's the, the, uh, which was given to Aaron by Moses. Eh? Aaron and then the Levites and all that. So Jesus is not a priest under that order. He's a priest under a different order, which is called the order of Melchizedek. Jesus is a priest. Jesus is a priest. Under the order of... Uh, under... Under the order of Melchizedek. All right. So Jesus is a priest under the order of Melchizedek. So he's not an, under the order of Aaron and the Levites because he's uh, from the from the tribe of Judah, not from the tribe of Levi. So now, if perfection has to come by the Levitical priesthood, then. I believe all the people who believe in Jesus then are on a very different, uh, um, very different kind of justification. All right, verse twelve says, "For the priesthood being uh, being changed, there there is made of necessity a change also of the law. So if the priesthood was changed from Levites to Melchizedek, then there also had to be a change of the law. So Jesus here is under the new law, new law." All right, he's under the new law or the new commandment. But here we see there's the old commandment which is being followed. Verse 13 says, For he of whom these things are spoken pertaineth to another tribe, of which no man gave attendance at the altar. Jesus is from another tribe. For it is evident that our Lord sprang out of Judah, of which tribe Moses spake nothing concerning priesthood. And it is far much more evident for that after the similitude of Melchizedek, there arises another priest who is made not after the law of a carnal commandment, but after the power of an endless life. So Jesus is a priest, not under a law which is carnal. This, this, these are carnal laws. These are... These are earthly laws because it was ending. The priests were coming and then they were ending. Remember, Jesus was a, or Melchizedek is a priest without a beginning or without an end. You can go and read Matthew, I mean, you can go and read Genesis 14. It will explain to you concerning uh, Melchizedek who was um, given a tithe by, by Abraham. So the, the whole story is there so you can be able to understand about that. And number three, if you want to follow the law, then you have to do works. Do works. The law demanded you do works, but grace does not demand any work. Grace here, there is no works. All right. Grace, no works. Here you have to do works. Let's see something about that. Romans 10.5, it says, For Moses described the righteousness which is of the law, that the man which doeth those things shall live by them. If you follow the law and if you say, I'm going to follow uh, the law of Moses, and you do those things, you're going to live by them. There's no way you're going to live by the law of Moses and also live in this other law. It cannot work that way. So you will have to keep the law if you're staying in this side. But let's continue and see. Is it really possible for you to be able to keep that law and continue? James 2.10 says... For whosoever shall keep the whole law and yet offend in one point is guilty of all. If you keep this law, you do these works. You say, I'm going to keep the law. Remember, the law has about 613 laws. We have 613 laws in the first five books of the Bible, in the Torah. So if you keep all these laws and you only break one, you've broken all of them. So how are you going to keep all this? Remember, those laws are very, very weird. Others are saying don't shave the sides of your head. Don't shave the sides of your beard. Don't, uh, women should not walk without uh, covering their heads. Um, men should not enter here. Th there's so much which is spoken. Actually, it's saying if, if someone does anything during this, the day of the Sabbath, they should literally be killed. If you, if, you, if you go to the kitchen and you light a match and you cook food, you should not cook anything during Sabbath. You should, it was very some very weird kind of laws. There's no way you can keep these laws. So, and the, the Bible says, if you break only one law, you're broken everyone, every other law. John 7, 19, it says, Did Moses give you the law 
and yet none of you keepeth the law? Why go ye about to kill me? This is the time that now, when Jesus had, uh, had uh, he, he, he was with, um, the, he, he gave some work to some guys during the Sabbath day. And then uh, these Pharisees, they wanted to, you know, they're saying, Jesus, how can you tell people to go to the farm to go and, uh, you know, do some farming work during Sabbath day? And uh, <laughs> they all were rising against Jesus. And then Jesus was just like, you guys, you have this law and no one of you has even kept one law. I am the Lord of the Sabbath. Remember Jesus himself he said, I am the Lord of the Sabbath. So if there's anything to do with Sabbath and keeping laws, I am the one who even understands and I'm the one who set these laws? Because Jesus, he told uh, the people time and time again, before Abraham was, I am. Before Abraham, even the one, the father of the Jews, became who he was or became their father, Jesus was still there. So he's the one who gave the laws. And he was telling them, you guys, you're just after rushing, you want to kill me even earlier before my days. Just because I told some people to go and work on a Sabbath. So he was trying to tell them, you can't keep these laws. You're only trying to fool yourself. You can't keep these laws. And also we see in Romans 3.20, the Bible says, Therefore by the deeds of the law, there shall no flesh be justified in sin's sight. No flesh, not even one flesh will be justified in sin sight, for by the law is the knowledge of sin. So we have to understand, why do we have the law? The law comes to show us what sin is. With the law, we get to know what sin is. Remember, this law is on that we always see the words, Thou shall not. Thou shall not do this. Thou shall not do this. Shall, thou shall not do this. Why? It is telling us, okay, this is sin. This is sin. This is sin. With the law, we are able to know what sin is. But with the law, we can't get a justification. We cannot get justification by the law. Justification comes by Jesus Christ. All right? Justification. So justification literally means just if. I had not sinned. It's like justified. Literally, it's like just as if I had not done anything. So you're only justified by Jesus Christ, but you can be justified by the law. So we have to understand that very, very well, that the reason we have the law, you know, there are people who ask, then if the law is not important, then why do we have the law? Why do we have those books of the law? Why do we have the Old Testament? Could it not have just been scrapped from the Bible? No, it could not have been scrapped. Why? Because with the law, we get to know what sin is. This is how God wants people to live. This is, this is, a, this is a quality of God. This is what God sees to be uh, the truth. This is what you need to follow. And we see Jesus when he came, what did he do? He fulfilled the law. Jesus from birth till death. He never broke one single law. One he never broke. And with him, he was able to fulfill the whole law. And then after he went to the cross and he was uh, crucified there, what did he say? It is finished. What was finished? He had already paid the price. He fulfilled the law. And also now through him being the Lamb of God who died for our sins, we were able to get justification. Now we don't need to follow the law. You see, there are people who say, uh, Jesus did not come to destroy the law. He came to fulfill it. Yes, he fulfilled it. But only the problem is that people don't really understand what it means by fulfilling the law. They think that now he came to strengthen it to make now everybody to follow the law. You can follow the law. If you're following the law, then you're lying to yourself because you, you have to follow the whole 613 laws. And if you break one you're in for it, you're broken, all of them. And remember, you're already born with sin because we are we're in the sinful nature of Adam. We are, we, we, are, we are not born in the image of God. Only Adam was created in the image of God. Because we see in Genesis 5.3, it tells us, and Adam gave birth or, 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 or he brought forth a son who was called Seth in his own image and his own likeness. Why is, why is the Bible telling us in the image of Adam and likeness of Adam? Because it was an image of sin. A likeness of sin. Now, it's not the image that God wanted, which is three out of three, the body, soul, and spirit. When Adam sinned, his spirit died. When the spirit died, the spirit controls both the body and the soul. The body, when you're alive, you will still die because, you know, the spirit has controlled it. And also when you die, 
you will go to hell because now this, the soul does not die. But now since the spirit died, then it means uh, you're deficient of something. And definitely, unless you're born again, when you're born again, what is to be born again? To be born again is literally bringing your spirit back to life. We are told, that Jesus said, unless you are born of water and spirit, you cannot enter the kingdom of God. Water and spirit. When a woman gives birth, water breaks. That's the, the first birth. And the second one is the spirit has to be born by you believing in the gospel. Romans uh, 4.15 says, because the law worketh wrath, for there was no law. Uh, sorry, for, for the law worketh wrath. The law worketh wrath. For where no law is, there is no transgression. So if we don't have the law, then we don't have sin. But now we see very well, because we have already begin, give, been given the law, what happens? It worketh wrath for us. Anytime you are under the law, then it is, it is always giving you, uh, giving you corrections and telling you, you have done wrong, you have done wrong, you have done wrong. So you are completely under wrath of God all the time. Something else you have to understand about the law. Many people think that the law then is corrupt and the law is bad and all that. No. The Bible tells us very well that the law is holy. All right? The law is holy. It was given by God. So it's holy. So it's not something which came from the blues. Romans 7.12. The Bible tells us something here. In Romans 7.12. It tells us, uh, Wherefore, the, uh, the law is holy and the commandment is holy and just and good. God himself, he tells us that the law is holy. There are people who say, okay, Keith, if you're saying then we don't have to follow the law. If the law is that, is that bad, then let's keep it away. Probably the law is bad. No, the law is very holy because it is showed us what sin is. So that you can be able to know the quality and the standards of God and how he wants things to be done. So we can be able to follow him. All right. And also another thing you have to understand is that the law is a curse. <laughs> very contradicting words. The law is a curse. The law is a curse. So if you follow the law, you're following, you're under a curse. Yes, it is holy. It was given by God to show us what sin is. But remember, the law is also a curse. It was literally to show us because of man's sinful nature, we, be, we came under a curse. We are now in a curse if we follow the law. Now, let me show you something. In Galatians 3.10, the Bible says, for as many as are of the works of the law are under a curse, for it is written, Cursed is everyone that continueth not in the book of the law to do them. If you continue to do the things of the law, then you are under a curse. For those people who say, no, I have to keep some things. I have to keep this, I have to keep this, I have to keep this. I have to make sure that there are things that I'm doing in accordance to what the law says. Then you are under a curse. That one you have to understand. All right? The other thing, the law is a slave driver. There is no peace. <laughs> the law is a slave driver. All right? In short, there is no peace with the law. With the law, you have no peace. Every day, you'll always be asking yourself, oh, I've, I've, I've done this. I've lied. I've uh, thought something bad. I have hated my brother. I've done this and that. All the time you're, you're under condemnation. You're always under condemnation. You're always fearing. But remember, Jesus told us, under Christ there is no condemnation. You can walk and do this and this and this, but you're not condemned. Why? Because in Christ there is no condemnation. But then it doesn't mean that because now we're under grace, we should continue in sin. No, God forbid. Paul tells us, should we continue in, a, in, a, in his sin? So that grace may abound. God forbid. No, you are not. That's not the reason. We should use, we should use this grace that you have been given for good, to do good things unto the kingdom of God. Knowing that even if we slip down and fall, even if we end up doing some something which is wrong and we find ourselves we have done something which we, we did not expect, then we know we are not under condemnation. We are not under condemnation. We can always thank God and say, I know I am saved once and for all and I'm going to heaven whether I have done something or have not done something as long as I believed the gospel. All right. So the law is a slave driver. 
there is no peace. Let me let me read for you. In Romans 7, 1, the Bible says, Know ye not, brethren, for I speak to them that know the law, how that the law has dominion over man as long as he liveth. The law has dominion over you as long as you live. It forces you to love God. It's like the law tells you, no, you have to follow God by 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 must you know it's a must for you to follow god but right now under grace we don't follow god because we are we are being forced no we follow christ because we love him we love him because of what he did for us how he died for our sins and i'm going to explain to you that one in just a bit all right so we don't follow uh we don't follow christ because we are forced to no it is a free will then the other thing is the law is a schoolmaster the law is a schoolmaster all right is a school master the law is a school master when i talk about the law being a school master it's meant to teach us something for a specific time all right galatians 3 22 the bible says but the scripture has concluded all under sin that the promise by faith of jesus christ might be given to them that believe Verse 23, but before faith came, we were kept under the law, shut up by the faith which should afterwards be revealed. Before faith came, the Bible is telling us, before faith came, we were kept under the law. So this law kept us before faith came. Why? All right. Uh, under the law, shut up to the faith which should afterwards be revealed. Wherefore, the law was our schoolmaster to bring us unto Christ so that we might be justified by faith. The law was just to our schoolmaster to teach us a few lessons on what sin is so that we can be justified by faith, all right? But after faith is come, we are no longer under schoolmaster. So now, since Jesus came and brought faith, we are no longer under schoolmaster. We are now under Christ, under grace. So if you follow the law, you're still following the schoolmaster. You're sc- still for- following the schoolmaster. And uh, the law definitely points us to Christ, all right? It points us to Christ for grace. And I'd like to show you a couple of... Uh, let, me, let me write this. The law points us, points us to Christ. The law points us to Christ. It shows us, here is Christ. I want you to follow him, Okay. And I want you to believe in him because you cannot fulfill all these 613 laws by yourself. Now, the only way you can be justified is by Christ Jesus through grace. All right. So the law shows us how difficult it is to follow this law. And then it tells us instead of you following all this, please go and be justified by faith in Christ Jesus. Romans 8 from verse 1 to 4, it says, There is therefore... Now no condemnation to them that which are in Christ Jesus, who walk not after the flesh, but after the spirit. There is no condemnation, not even one, to them that which are in Christ Jesus. So when you're in Christ, you're not condemned by the law. You're not condemned by the law. Verse 2, for the law of the spirit of, uh, for the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus has made me free from the law of sin and death. This law is called the law of sin. It teaches you what sin is. Now, when you're in Christ, you're no longer under this law which is telling you what sin is. You already know what sin is, but now you're following the cross. Okay? Verse 3. For what the law could do, uh, for what the law could not do, in that it was weak through the flesh, God sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh and for sin condemned sin in the flesh. So Jesus himself, he came and he fulfilled all this law so that we don't need to fulfill it by ourselves. The Bible tells us by one man, sin entered the, 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 the world. And also by another man, we got righteousness. One man who brought sin, how did sin enter? You see, people say that sin came by Satan. No, Satan did not bring sin. Satan he was only a deceiver. He was only saying, hey, this and this and this you can do. Please believe me. Don't believe God. What happened in the Garden of Eden? Adam and Eve, they were sitting there. They were eating. God had told them, don't, you can eat from any other fruit, but don't eat from that tree. Okay? When you eat from that tree, you're surely going to die. What, what happened? Satan came and told them, he's told you you're going to die. No, you're not going to die. 
He has lied to you. Don't believe him. Don't believe God. You're not going to die. So exactly what happened? These guys, they did not believe God and they believed the serpent. So the moment they disbelieved God, that is the moment when sin came. They ate from that fruit and surely they died. And now all through, sin has always been the sin of unbelief. That's why the Bible has always told us, whosoever believes in him will not perish. Believe in Jesus Christ. Believe. Believe in his blood. Believe. It's all about belief. It's not about stop sinning. No. God will help you to stop sinning. But it's all about belief. Do you believe in him? 100%. And after you believe in him, then the fruit of believing, it, is, it will start to, to, to be shown by yourself through the good things that you're doing. If, if I believe in something, then I, like, I will start loving what I believe in. I will, if, I, if I believe uh, maybe in a certain course, I believe, uh, I believe I can become a pilot, maybe for example, I start studying things to do with uh, you know, uh, planes and all those kind of things. I won't say I believe in, in, uh, in, uh, in uh, aeroplanes and I'm, and I'm dealing with ships. It, it doesn't work like that, you see? The fruits have to be manifested by... To show what exactly you believe. So if you say you believe in Jesus and you're living 100% in sin, then it means there's something really wrong. You have never actually believed. So that's really, really important. You have to understand that. Verse 4 says that the righteousness of the law might be fulfilled in us who walk not after the flesh, but they that are after the spirit, the things of the spirit. So once you're in this side, you walk in the spirit. The Bible tells us, do not walk in the flesh, walk in the spirit. The moment you're walking in the flesh, because once you're saved, there are a couple of things which happen. When you're saved, you become a new creature. When you become a new creature, it means there's an old creature and the new creature. So the new creature is your spirit and your soul have become one, all right? And God has cut out the flesh, okay? And once he has cut out the flesh, it means the flesh is the old creature and the, and the spirit and the soul is the new creature. So walk under the new creature, not after the flesh. So that's exactly what the Bible tells us. And of course, we, are, we become sons of God. We are in Christ and Christ is in us. We have inheritance in heaven. We also have Christ imputed righteousness. We can't go to heaven through the blood of animals, through this law. We can never go to heaven. We can only go to heaven through Christ Jesus who died for our sins. And this one even explains very well why people back in the days used to go to Abraham's bosom when they died. All right. All people from the time of, uh, you know, from the beginning of the world, those people who died and they were good. They were good people. They had already uh, sacrificed uh, for their sins. They never went to heaven directly. No, they went to Abraham's bosom. Whereby we know the story of Lazarus and the, and the rich man, okay? And how it happened and Lazarus was in one side and, and the other, you, you see, and hell was in one side and Abraham's bosom in one side. But right now, do we see that? No. Apostle Paul tells us to be absent from the body, it is to be present with God. So immediately you leave your body, you're present with God. Why? Because Jesus came and when he died, he went down there and he set the captives free. Those people who had Abraham's bosom, they were set free and they went up to heaven because it was only by the blood of Jesus Christ that people could, able, could be able to enter heaven. And the book of Isaiah tells us right now that now hell has enlarged. For those people who think that hell is still small, no, it has enlarged. Abraham's bosom and hell became one huge hall, eh, whereby everybody who is a sinner will go there. So you have to know that. In Ephesians 2.13 it says, But now in Christ Jesus, ye who sometimes were far off are made nigh by the blood of Jesus Christ. Those who are far from God, now you are made near by the blood of Jesus Christ. All right. So that's really, really important to understand that fact. Likewise, We see the law was all about remission of sins. But now grace, it is about forgiveness of sins. The law was about remission of sins. This one gave remission of sins. But now this one, let me me show. This one, the law only gave uh, the blood of gods. Blood of gods gave remission. Gave remission of sins. But here under grace, we get something called redemption. 
Alright? And forgiveness of sins. Now, under Jesus Christ, we are forgiven all our sins, past, present, and future. Past, present, and future. We are forgiven once and for all. We get redemption. Jesus forgives us 100% all our sins. Let's see also verse, uh, let's see, uh, in Ephesians, Ephesians 2, 14 says, For he is our peace who has made both one and has broken down the middle wall of partition between us. There was a middle wall of partition between us and God. It has been broken. Having abolished in his flesh the enmity between the law of the commandments contained in the ordinances, contained in the ordinances, um, for to make himself of twine one new man, so making peace, and that he might reconcile both unto God in one body by the cross, having slain the enmity thereby. All right? So we see Jesus himself, he was able to, to cut off that, that veil or that thing which was blocking us between us and God. So he broke it up. And now we have direct access to God through the blood of Jesus Christ. So now through the blood of Jesus Christ, we know we are saved. We know 100% we are saved and will never be forsaken. So Jesus literally abolished the law. In Romans 10.4, it tells us, For Christ is the end of the law. Jesus is the end of the law. All right, Christ is the end of the law. So if you're following the law, then you can't follow the law and follow Christ. You have to choose one. So Christ is the end of the law. The Bible tells us very clearly, for Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone that believes. So if you believe, then that's the end of the law. So how do we believe in Jesus Christ? How do we come out from this law or come out from unbelief to following Christ? How can you be able to say that you're saved and you know 100% this is it and you know you're born again? There's only one way that you can be born again. The Bible tells us very well in John 3, 16, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whoever believes will not perish but have everlasting life. Believes. Believes in what? There, there must be something that you believe in. In Ephesians uh, 1.13, it tells us, In whom you trusted after that you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation. So you have to hear the word of truth, which is the gospel of your salvation. And the Bible continues saying, In whom you believed, you are sealed with that Holy Spirit of promise. The moment you believe in this word of truth, which is the gospel of your salvation, you are sealed with that Holy Spirit of promise. And that Holy Spirit is the one that we were promised before. Jesus said, I will send you the Holy Spirit who will abide in you forever. We're not told the Holy Spirit will come and go. No, he will abide in us forever. And we are told we should not, Ephesians 4.30 says, And do not grieve the Holy Spirit in whom you are sealed unto the day of redemption. The moment you will be redeemed, that is the only time the Holy Spirit will come out from you. All right? We are told we are sealed with him. He is in us to guide us and to show us we should walk, we should do, we should do all these things. So it's very possible that you can be saved and you stay with that Holy Spirit and is not going to go anywhere. So now, what is this gospel? I've told you what you have been told. Let's believe. So what is that gospel? The gospel is found... The gospel... The gospel is found in the book of 1 Corinthians 15, 1 through 4. So we are told to believe this gospel. The moment you believe this gospel, you are saved and you're sealed by the Holy Spirit of promise. Now, what does this verse say? Let me read for you slowly so that you can be able to understand what the gospel talks about. It says, Moreover, brethren, I declare unto you the gospel. I declare what? The gospel. This is Apostle Paul. He's telling us, I declare unto you the gospel, which I preached unto you. So you have to hear the gospel preached, which I preached unto you, uh -huh, which also you have received and wherein you stand. So you have to hear the gospel preached. You have to receive it. And then you have to stand in the gospel. Okay. 
you have to stand in the gospel by which also you are saved. So the same gospel is the one which saves you. So you have to hear the gospel preached. You have to receive the gospel and you have to stand in the gospel by which also you are saved. So you are saved by the gospel. If you keep in memory what I preached unto you, unless you believed in vain. You have to keep in memory the gospel unless you believed in vain. Believing in vain is believing what? That there is something that I can do to gain myself salvation. I think because I was baptized, because I went to church, because I gave tithe, because I, I was always a good person. I never lied. I never did this. And I think, I think I'm a good person. I, I deserve heaven because I'm good. No, that is believing in vain, believing in your works. Believing that there's something that you can do apart from the blood of Jesus Christ, which was shed. Jesus shed his blood, all right? He shed his blood for you. And this blood is the one which is the one which gave us salvation. So unless you go through this blood of Jesus Christ, then you cannot be saved. For those people who say, ah, you know, I can go to heaven in other different ways. No, how can you go to heaven with other different ways? Let's continue there from verse 3. It says, For I delivered unto you first of all which that which I also received, how that Christ died. How did Jesus die? How that let me read it first. Eh? How that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, and that he was buried, and that he rose again the third day according to the scriptures. How that Christ died, we have to we have five folds of salvation. Christ died for our sins, was buried rose again the third day according to the scriptures. If you believe that Christ died, it means you believe that God the Son came here in form of a man. Jesus came and he died like a man. If you believe it was for your sins, then he did not die for any other reason. He died for your sins to give you salvation. If you believe that he was buried, it means you believe that he became the unleavened bread. He became sin for you and he took your sins and left them in the grave. So he became sin for you. All right? And if you believe that he rose again, he rose by the power of the Holy Spirit. And the same Holy Spirit who is sealed inside you is the one who is going to raise you up on that day. When uh, the rapture comes or when you die, that's the same Holy Spirit who is going to raise you up because he's inside you. And as well, if you believe is according to the scriptures, it means you believe the, uh, the Bible because you are not there when Jesus was, be was being crucified. You are not there. So you believe the scriptures. It is written in the Bible. So you believe God the Father. God the Father is the one who gave the whole Bible from Genesis to Revelation. So it means you believe God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. And you believe it was from for your sins that Jesus died, was buried, and resurrected the third day according to the scriptures. The Bible tells us very well, when you believe this, then you are saved. It is how that Christ died. How did Jesus die? He shed his blood. This is how Jesus died. All right. You have to believe and understand how Jesus died. He shed his blood. If Jesus could have died of a heart attack or maybe died of, a, of a drowning in water or died of electrocution or something which does not involve blood, then there could be no salvation. Why? Because without shedding of blood, there is no remission of sins. There had to be blood which is shed so that there can be forgiveness of sins. And it's not like you tell Jesus, come into my heart. No. According to the law, how was forgiveness of sins done? The, if you sin and if you do something wrong, the Bible, the law had told people, you take a lamb, you go to it uh, with it uh, to the altar, you hold it like this with your own hand, and then you cut the neck. And as you cut that animal, you're believing that this lamb, this blood which is being shed right now as I cut it, this is the blood that I'm trusting which will forgive, make me be forgiven of my sins. Because uh, the priest could take that blood and go and pour it in the altar. That's the only way you trusted that blood. You see, you could not tell the lamb, hey, lamb, come into my heart. It could not be like that. But now people try to change the gospel and try to say, no, Jesus, come into my heart. How? We are trusting the blood. The Bible tells us in Romans uh, 3.25, it tells us, in whom God has set forth, to, uh, in whom God set forth to become a propitiation, the propitiation for our sins. What is propitiation? The act of appeasing wrath. And in Ephesians 1 7, the Bible tells us uh, 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 we, we are redeemed through faith in his blood. Let me, let me read it that one for you. In Ephesians 
1, 7, it tells us very well, in whom we have redemption, we have redemption through faith in his blood, the forgiveness of sins. The moment you have faith in, it, in the blood of Jesus, we have redemption, we have forgiveness of sins, we have this redemption. So you have to believe in this blood. This is the gospel. Once you believe that, you're saved there and then. So let's continue. In Romans 6, 14, To 15, it says, For sin shall not have dominion over you, for you are not under the law, but under grace. Sin, this sin, will not have dominion over you. Because you are not under the law, you are under the grace. You are not following the things of the law, you are following the grace. And uh, verse 15 says, What then? Shall we sin because we are not under the law, but under grace? God forbid. Now, should we start saying, okay, now since we are here, we know we have been forgiven our past, present, and future sins. Should we now start sinning because we know, yeah, nothing can happen. I already know I am sealed and sanctified. No, God forbid. Why? Because the Bible tells us, in whom you yield your members to, the same is whom you obey. If you yield your members to, uh, if you yield your members, uh, if you yield your members to sin, You'll be, you, you'll be following and you'll be, uh, and you'll be a servant of sin. If you yield your members to righteousness, you'll be a servant to righteousness. So whoever you yield your members, your members is your, is your new man or your body or, you know, your body. Whatever you yield to, that is who your master is. All right. So the Bible tells us the fruits of the Holy Spirit, because the moment you are saved, you have the Holy Spirit and the fruits of the Holy Spirit can be seen in us. The Holy Spirit is, is like wind. You can't say wind is going this way or this way. You can only see it by the results. It's carrying papers towards that side. It, you see some, some clothes are being flown that side or this side. You can know the wind is going this side. So if you're saying you have the Holy Spirit and you're, you're going towards sin all the time, then you don't have the Holy Spirit. You're probably not even saved. All right. In Galatians 2.19 to 21, it says, For I, through the law, I am dead to the law, that I might live. I might live unto God. I am dead to the law. This law to me is dead, so that I may live to God. I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live, yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. And the life which now uh, live in the flesh, I live by the faith of Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. Now, I'm not living by myself. I am living by the love and the, and, and the mercy of Jesus Christ, who died for me. I do not frustrate the grace of God, for if righteousness came by the law, then Christ is dead in vain. If righteousness came by the law, then Christ died in vain. And we know you cannot be justified by the law. You can only be justified by faith in Jesus Christ. So if you have to follow the law and say, I have to do this and this and things because of that, I can know I am, uh, you know, I am better. I do not lie. Do not do this. Do not... If I'm following the law, I'm trying to keep that law, then Christ died in vain. It means I can can enter heaven in my own way. It's like I'm trying to say, Jesus, no, you died for me this part. Let me me also die for myself in this other part. It can't work like that. In Galatians 5, 1 to 4, it says, Stand fast, therefore, in the liberty wherewith Christ has made us free, and are not entangled again with the yoke of bondage. Behold, I, Paul, say unto you that if you be circumcised, Christ shall profit you nothing. So if you follow the law, you say, I'll be circumcised and do all these things. This, when he says circumcision, it means following the law. When I follow the law, then it means Christ died for nothing. For I testify again to every man that is circumcised that he is a debtor to do the whole law. If you decide I'm following the law, then you are a debtor to follow the whole law. You will have to follow everything. Christ has become of no effect unto you. Whosoever of you are justified by the law, you are fallen from grace. If you want to be justified by this law, you are already fallen from grace. Those people who are trying to follow the law, number one, they have to understand that they are not under grace. The moment you find yourself trying to do things of the law, things of the law is like what? You're walking and saying, yeah, I have to go to church and go and tithe the way I'm supposed to tithe. Those tithers, they are following the law. Personally, I don't tithe. Why? Because that's under the law. And if you want to keep me under the law, then I'm not under grace. So you're trying to pull me back to some works of things. And many, many other things that people try to do to justify themselves. You'd be falling from, the, from grace. Now, let's see something. The Bible tells us that we are dead to the law. We are totally, absolutely dead to the law. 
In Romans 7, 1 to 6, it says, Know ye not, brethren, for I speak to them that know the law. Paul is saying, I'm speaking to people who understand the law because already you know what, what sin is. You understand the law. How that the law has dominion over a man as long as he liveth. It will have dominion of you. Be, as long as you're living, you are, it has dominion over you. But remember, for the woman which has an husband is bound by the law to her husband so long as he liveth. But if the husband be dead, she is loosed from the law so that she is no adulteress, though she is married to another man. If you are under the law, you are married. You are already under the law of your husband. Then unless that husband dies, then you are loosed from the law. Remember, we died, we were buried in Christ and rose again with Christ. The moment you believed in Christ, you died with him and you rose again with him. So according to God, you are already dead to the law. The moment you believed in Jesus, you are dead. So the law has no dominion over you. It's like going to uh, go, going to a cemetery and trying to wake up those bodies and tell them, hey, why are you not following the law? How can people in a cemetery follow the law and they're already dead? That's exactly how it is. You're baptized with Jesus Christ. And baptism is not, is not by water. We are now baptized by faith. Colossians 2.10, it tells us that, uh, actually 2.11, it tells us about we are baptized by faith and reason by faith with Jesus Christ. So you're not baptized by water. It is now by faith, by faith. You die with Christ by faith. And the moment you die with Christ by faith, you are no longer under that law. Verse 4, it says, Wherefore, my brethren, you, you also are become dead to the law by the body of Christ that you should be married to another, even him who is raised from the dead, that we should bring forth fruit unto God. You are married to Jesus Christ. The moment you died, you are married to another man. You died from the law of Moses, and now you rose up married to Jesus Christ. But there are people who want who wants to be married to Jesus Christ, but they are still dating Moses? How can it happen? You want to be here, but then you're still dating Moses. How, how can it be? You have to die. There have to be something which is at the middle, shows you now you're in this grace. You're not here. All right? Verse 5. For when we are in the flesh, the motions of sin which are by the law did work in our members to bring forth fruit unto death. But now we are delivered from the law that being dead wherein we are held... That we should serve in newness of spirit, not in the oldness of the letter. Not in the oldness of the letter, serve in the newness of spirit. This letter of Moses, we don't serve that letter of Moses. We serve in the spirit. Galatians 2.16 says, Knowing that a man is not justified by the works of the law, but by the faith of Jesus Christ, even we have believed in Jesus Christ that we might be justified by faith of Christ and not by the works of the law. For by works of the law shall not flesh be justified. If you follow the law, you will never be justified. Justification is only by Jesus Christ. Romans 4, 4 to 5, it says, Now to him that worketh is, is the reward not reckoned of grace, but of debt. If you work, if you say, I'm going to do works, your results is not reckoned by, uh, by grace, but of debt. Verse 5 says, But to him that worketh not, but believeth on him that justifies the uh, godly, his faith is counted for righteousness. If you don't work, if you say, I will not follow these laws of Moses, I'm going to uh, follow Christ by faith, then your faith is counted for righteousness. The moment you have faith in Jesus Christ, then your faith is counted for righteousness. You, are be- you become righteous by following Christ, all right? Romans uh, 3, 25 to 26, it tells us something. Whom God has set forth to be a propitiation. I told you about this. God has set forth Christ to be a propitiation. Through faith in his blood to declare his righteousness for the remission of sins that are past through the forbearance of God. To declare, I say, verse 26. To declare, I say, at this at this time, his righteousness, that he might be just and the justifier of him which believeth in Jesus. The moment you believe in Jesus, you are justified. His blood justifies you. And the justifier of this, uh, the justifier, your justifier, is already just himself. You see here, if a priest was, uh, uh, was helping you to be forgiven of your sins by the sacrifice that you're doing, first the priest had to go and sacrifice an animal for himself. 
because he's not just. And then after he, he, he sacrifices an animal for himself, now he, he starts now waiting on you to sacrifice your animal and then he takes that blood. And without that, then he could have died inside that altar. But now we have another priest, the high priest, who is already just by himself. All right? He's already just. So you don't need to have an, any other thing. You already, the justifier of you is already just by himself. And uh, verse 27 says, Where is boasting then? It is ex excluded. By what law? Of works? Nay, by th but by the law of faith. We are told that now we don't have to boast. Because of what? We are not, we are not uh, excluded by the law of works. It is the law of faith. The law of faith. And verse 28 says, Therefore we conclude that a man is justified by faith without the deeds of the law. We are justified by faith without the deeds of the law. And uh, in Galatians 3, from verse 1 to verse 3, it says, O foolish Galatians, who has bewitched you that you should not obey the truth? The truth is the gospel. Before whose eyes Jesus Christ has been evidently set forth, crucified among you. So you're already set forth. You're evidently set forth. Christ has been set forth. You've been given the truth. And then, this is Paul was talking to the Galatians. He was telling them that uh, they are trying to follow the, 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 the law instead of the truth. Why? Because they had already been given the truth. And in verse 2 says, this only... Would I learn of you, receive the Spirit by the works of the law or by the hearing of faith? And are you so foolish, having begun in the Spirit, and yet now are made perfect by the flesh? You started in the Spirit. You started by believing. Now you want to be purified and justified by the flesh. How can it be? Verse 10 says, For as many eyes of the works of the law are under a curse, for it is written, Cursed is everyone that continueth to do those things. Those things, not in all things which are written in the books of the law to do them, but that no man is justified by the law in the sight of God. It is evident for the just shall live by faith. And the law is not of faith, but the man that doeth them shall live in them. Christ has redeemed us from the curse of the law, being made a curse for us. For it is written, Cursed is everyone that hangeth on a tree. That the blessing of Abraham might come on the Gentiles through Christ, that we might receive the promise of the Spirit through faith. And uh, finally, in verse 26 says, For we are the children, we are all the children of God by faith in Jesus Christ. So we understand, we are not children of God through the law. We are children of God through faith in Jesus Christ. So the moment you believe, this is all about faith. All right? The moment you believe, and it's faith in the blood, all right? Or we call it the faith in the gospel. The moment you believe in Jesus Christ, in his blood, and you believe in the gospel, his death, burial, and resurrection, according to the scriptures, for you, then you're saved. We should not longer follow this law because the law, we have been told, the law is a curse. The law will only make you know what sin is. It will only condemn you. It will only make you feel bad about yourself. But you'll no way be justified by the law. All right? So I believe this has been a blessing to you. I believe uh, it's something that you can be able to be, uh, to understand. So go through and you can also share the video so that other people can be able to understand. Have a blessed time. Uh, great.